So hello everyone. Um, yeah, first of all, first of all, many thanks to Method Arts for organizing this um, symposium and for kindly accept my my proposal. Um, so I am a Portuguese jewelry artist uh, currently living in Germany, but concluding my PhD in the arts at University of of Hust. Um, through my practice, I've been interested uh, in the idea of fragmentation and reconstruction uh, of an image of a landscape. And, and I do this through jewelry and, and objects. And uh, Gratical, what we will see now, is for me almost um, an autobiographical work uh, where I explore hybrid, hybrid forms of writing. And, and I use these to navigate through um, past lines that gave me um, insights about the different process of fragmentations that I conduct uh, in materials. Um, so we will navigate um, through several pictures. Some I will be um, directly connected to what I am saying, um, but some I will not address directly, but somehow they all um, belong to my artistic uh, process. One of the particularities of lines that I'm most fascinated with is their capacity to mimic each other in their interconnection. A fault in the land before is a fault is a network of smaller fractures. The event of one fracture will spur the next one as they form along until they finally successfully crack a massive amount of rock. This phenomenon is often observed when two tectonic blades separate from each other. The hot mantle rises then from the depths of the earth and occupies the space created by the fault, like blood flowing from a cut in the arm that solidifies to form new crust. These lines are made of continuous gestures, <clears throat> but also intervales and discontinuities. It is in these gaps that the feeling forms a new land and new lines are formed where life can then proceed. In this encounter, fresh magma is pressed against much older rocks, which is later on exposed to the surface by erosion. In this manner, when we look at the ground, what we see is an encounter of times, of different times, a multiplicity of events enriched and marked by layers. Tagos is the longest river of Iberian Peninsula. It crosses the central part of Spain and following an east-west direction divides Portugal in two, ending his journey while draining into the Atlantic. It is an historical river, loaded with departures and arrivals and the intercepting of boats, people and goods have dramatically and permanently changed the course of the modern era. I have often watched his waters flow into the Atlantic. In certain places, it is possible to see how the two waters pacifically blend in each other. The meeting of the fresh and salt waters sometimes manifests as a delicate line marked by the distant colors that depending on the weather, gray blue with a soft beige, the variations are perhaps endless. But most of the time, this line is in fact colorless <clears throat> almost imperceptible, the kind of line that turns invisible when one isn't paying attention, but nevertheless does not cease to exist. I was in my 20s when I first heard the meaning of the word tajo, tagos in Spanish. I had previously never thought of the river as a cut in the land excavated by the water. Learning the sharpness of his name changed in an irreversible manner my relationship to it. Ever since I like to think the river brought to me his meaning from a foreign land. My father lived at that time, my grandfather lived at that time, the darkness of dictatorship in Portugal between 1933 and 1974. He worked as an economist for a metal casting company in Lisbon 
He had thousands of account books where he would fill in with numbers. He died before I was born in a car accident in one of those asphalt lines that cross entire landscapes and cities and often interrupt people's lives. So we unfortunately never met. However, I still have some of those books, some completely filled with his beautiful handwritten numbers, others that had remained empty. I particularly enjoy drawing on the unused books, break through the parallel and perpendicular grids that occupy the entire pages. It is satisfying to observe an organic line full of imperfections and faults developing within such a rigid structure. One day, while we met for lunch in the neighborhood of Grasse in Lisbon, my father told me that in this company, they cast several pieces of the train lines that were built later on in Africa. He simply said these words. We look at each other and we kept silent. I knew my father's political ideas well enough to imagine what might have been in his head. My grandfather, like my father after him, and like every Portuguese citizen, directly or indirectly, was connected to the lines of occupation in Africa. But in this specific case, my grandfather was indirectly connected to the transport lines or connector lines, as Tim Ingold says, the kind of lines that change most probably forever our perception of the environment and the forms we related to it. Quote, the line in the course of history has been gradually shorn of the movement that gave rise to it. Once the trace of a continuous gesture, the line has been fragmented under the sway of modernity into a section of points and dots. This fragmentation, as I shall explain, has taken place in the related fields of travel where wafering is replaced by destination-oriented transport mapping, where the drawn sketch is replaced by the route plan and textuality, where storytelling is replaced by the pre-composed plot. It has also transformed our understanding of place. Once a knot tied from multiple and interlaced strands of movement and growth, it now figures as a node in a static network of connectors. End of quote, in gold lines. The imaginary of the rail line growing over the African land landscape resonate with me over the years. I would think about it now and then, I guess I still do. I greatly realize how the lines of occupation in Africa were the beginning of the modern transport line. And like the lines of trails that are formed by wandering and wafering in a continuous gesture of surge in the grass, the lines of transportation that connect dot to dot are built in relation to the incoming and outgoing traffic that is believed to pass through them. The lines we have created to transport the fruits of extraction become deeply embedded in us and inside of us. Nature and humankind have always had a relationship which ebbs and flows. Our fascination with materials, especially those only available elsewhere, has often led us to exploit, destroy, and scramble. The desire for raw materials rose sharply during the colonial times, and it has only continued to grow since. The thrill and the, uh, the way others felt for rare materials is something that I observed when I arrived in Germany in a very particular place called Ider Oberstein. A place well known for stone working, Ider Oberstein is repleted with ateliers that are still working and exploring these millennium stone carving and facetting techniques. Until the 18th century, the area was a source for agate and jasper. It was only after the 18th century when the gemstone sources of the region were disappearing that in an attempt to find solutions, miners and dealers traveled to Brazil and Africa, discovering in 1927 
the world's most important agate deposit in Brazil, state of Rio Grande do Sul. Around 1834, the first deliver of agate from Rio Grande do Sul were shipped to Ider Oberstein. On the wall of Elderstein Museum rests a Guinness record of an agate durs that has been cut into 75 discs. Original, the geode was about one meter and a half, much bigger than what the stone cutters of the region had ever seen in the past. Currently, a much more substantial variety of gemstones can be found in the shops of Ider Oberstein. Rose quartz from Brazil, jaspis from India, amethyst from Uruguay, ametrine from Bolivia, moss agate from India, rhyolite from Texas, calcedon from South Africa, dalamiter jaspis from Mexico, aventurine from India, tagarai from Australia, malachite from Congo, turquoise from China, Lapis Lazul from Afghanistan, Crisocol from Peru, Rio Croncit from Argentina, Sodalit from Nambia, Sapphire from Sri Lanka, Rubies from Kenya, Tanzanite from Tanzania, the list goes on and on. Stones from all over the world are exposed in vitrines sometimes in a, even in a sort of cages, just like natural museums where nature is exhibited in form of trophies or semaphore objects. They are cut in half and polished, revealing a shiny spectacular show, testimony of geological data, naked, seductive, displays on the shelves, showing their flat surface. Stones look like modern computer screens being shown in a computer shop. Their screens are portals of a parallel world, of an almost internal endurance. As I walk along corridors, I reflect on how easy it would be for me to grab one. It, won't, it would only take a second to have it in my hands. All things are potentially naval, and they're all potentially ready to the hand, as Edgar says. The shelves are designed in such a way that every human body feels central in that scenario. From every point, each shelf is like a conveyor belt, full of fragments organized into quality, colors, sizes, diversity, all coming to the encounter of our hands. I cut a gemstone apart, and I was instantly awaited by the beauty that I found inside. But the cut seemed almost as an act of aggression, as if I was cutting the road, as if I, with a diamond saw, was making a highway in the landscape or a train line, crossing lines and tearing apart a sort of cosmic matrix made of infinitesimal connections. How could I split apart such an image, imprint in the gemstone, through complex crystallization process, and in a reversible manner change the initial event? When I read Roger Calois in the writing of the stones, 1970, for the first time, I could relate it to him because I have observed stones and gemstones from the inside. He suggested that once a stone is open, a world of ideas is accessed, providing incredible similarities between the outside world and the inner world of a gemstone. Their concealment often looks like landscapes mountains, rivers, skies, stars, or sometimes even cities in ruins with fantastic heroes. Within this research, he was persuaded to think that human invention is only a development of data inheriting things, including minerals and stones, which contain inside a form of calligraphy. He knew that the world is finite, that things repeat, combine and overlap, creating recognizable patterns in diverse environments. He knew that every surface holds the potential to enter into other dimensions and that the world is nothing more than a constant inside and outside repeated at different scales 
in a fractalized and intimate relationship. Currently, my working table is full of materials, natural stones, hard and soft, artificial and synthetic materials, metals, non-metalloids, woods, silicon, plastic, shells, fossils, etc. Some were found and I have kept the original form. Some I have manipulated. A collection of fragments that has been brought together over the past 10 years while I have been exploring the landscape of Utsruk and the gemstone shops of Ida Robertstein. My working place has slowly been transformed into a kind of mimicry altar. Natural and man-made materials resonate in each other's properties. I have tried to look and organize the landscape of materials through an empiric view, studying the materials and their significant difference and similarities in origin, size, shape, substance, quantitative aspects, and even different uses throughout human history. While I study what the landscape is made of, I fragment it, creating sections and rooms. But these rooms are only temporary, ultimately by cultivating the space of the studio practice, I and the materials mutually shape each other. I use them as means to think about technology, artifacts, landscapes, living and non-living beings, diving in the world of correspondence. Through these materials, I gain a glimpse of a more intertwined and less fragmentary world. I found this picture. A few days my father had passed away in the hospital in 2014. My father was a photojournalist and a colleague and a friend of his had posted on Facebook saying, look, Hernando caught in action. I was surprised because I had spent my whole life looking at pictures taken by him and I rarely saw pictures of him. My mother was right next to me. We both looked at the picture and she immediately recognized that moment to which I had returned so often with her mind. 1974, 25 of April, Street Vitor Cordon in Lisbon. The Portuguese army re-established a democratic regime in Portugal after 40 years of dictatorship. We recognize my father in the middle of the street carrying a camera and she proceeds telling me she was there too. Not on the same side of the picture where my father was so we could immortalize that moment, but she was on the other side in the crowd together with the other protesters. I've often admired this picture since then. There is a quality in the performative gesture of the line formed by the heaps of people, which reminded me of the lines I have made in my grandfather's book and those printed on the stone by the geology of time. These lines contain a spontaneous beauty, a sense of oddity and some anomaly, which for me contrasted with, with the rigidity of our habitated world. It was only years later, in 2017, while I began my doctoral research in the arts, that I realized how the registration process of the lines that I incorporated in my grandfather's book was fundamentally different to the process of mapping the earth. Here, in an opposite movement, a grid of geometrical lines of latitude and longitude, called gratical, were implemented in order to project the earth onto a flat surface, finding in this way suitable forms to compartmentalize space so it could be better defined and measured. I gradually understood how the way we deal with space and time is intrinsically connected with the way we handle materials in our hands. I've come to realize how the very essence of perception is movement. It is only because we scan the terrain of events and objects moving from nearby towards the distance that we can perceive them. As a jewelry artist, the distant ways I approach materials is not to see them simply as physical realities and neither as only an imagined idea I have of them. Rather, they are stories 
even before they turn into physical options. Those stories are, are my own engagement with life that lead my research more in some directions than others. But they also contain the stories of the materials before and after I had the pleasure to cross my life with theirs. The lines, the cuts and the fractures I make in materials are in his way an inquiry to the matter, meant to transverse their physicality, to connect in a broader sense with the surroundings. They are the result of an embodied activity that is habitat by space and practice. While I cut, saw, break, and bring materials together, my gestures carry a sort of muscular conscience tied up by the lines I do and turn to be while wafering around in the process of care and knowing. I remember the work of Joan Araujo, 1971, a Venezuelan artist, when I discovered a second picture of that exactly moment, 25 of April, taking place in the city center of Lisbon. Araujo has done an exhibition called Los Jardines que se Furcan, in English, The Garden of the, of the Forking Paths. The title was stolen from the book of Jorge Luis Borges, and related to the labyrinth of references, appropriations that define our creative process. When I place both pictures of the revolution side by side, I noticed how unbelievable, almost identical they were and simultaneous, how dissimilar. It is impossible to say how long had passed between the two and which one was taken first. The second was a photo from Alfredo Cunha, but the author of the first remained unknown. In the first, my father was present, and in the second, he was gone. Looking at these two pictures was like looking at the gemstone cut in the middle, or to Araujo's work, Mickey and Yekin, 2018. They seem almost identical, yet minor details change, shapes, opacity, colors, etc. Does the openness ease the passing of time? Walking through Araujo's exhibition, where the image of different worlds seems to duplicate while bifurcating, was like the opening of a book or the opening of a stone. It was as if time forked itself since the cat had duplicated the image. Thus, perhaps the power of the objects that we touch is exactly that that they touch us back. We inherit their stories and their lines, inherit their landscapes, they have witness and the experience and the stuff they are made of. And in this inerring is a silent inerring, which does not knock on the door, but it moves along like a river or a crack on the stone. Thank you.